Correct. Okay, we keep hearing uh, uh, some uh, computer voice coming out explaining that we're, we're live. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Green Growth Knowledge Platform's webinar on making pro core inclusive green growth a reality. My name is Orestes Anastasia, and I head up knowledge management at the Global Green Growth Institute, also known as GGGI, one of the GGKP's founding partners. Before we, we begin today's webinar, I would like to provide a few words of introduction. The GGKP was established in 2012, just before Rio Plus 20, by GGGI, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the United Nations Environment Program, and the World Bank. Since that time, the GGKP has expanded considerably and now reflects a global partnership with more than 45 leading international organizations, research institutes, and think tanks. These partners share a common belief that mobilizing a green economy transition requires that policymakers, practitioners, and experts have access to cutting edge knowledge and data to support their efforts. So with this in mind, the GGKP focuses on two main sets of activities. The first is to work with our partner institutions to identify and address major knowledge gaps in green growth theory and practice. And today's webinar will discuss some of the work emanating from that effort. The second is to identify, gather, and share knowledge and data at the nexus of economic development and environmental sustainability with a growing community of practice. As part of these activities, the GGKP hosts a Green Growth webinar series, uh, such as uh, this webinar is part of, with thanks to the generous financial support from the Swiss government. Today's webinar will focus on a recently released report by GGGI, the International Institute for Environment and Development, and the Green Economy Coalition, titled pro Core Inclusive Green Growth, Experience and a New Agenda. Noting the importance of this topic, I should mention that this is the same theme of the upcoming GGKP annual conference, which focuses on transforming development through inclusive green growth. GGGI will be hosting, hosting this year's uh, annual conference, the fourth GGKP annual conference, here in Korea during September 6th and 7th, as part of what we are calling Global Green Growth Week. Now, Global Green Growth Week will consist of more than 20 high-level policy dialogues, workshops, and other events, including uh, the Global Green Growth Summit. The GGKP Annual Conference will be one of the flagship events of the week, uh, with more than 60 speakers. Uh, and we expect conference participants will be able to discuss the latest research, policy, best practices, and innovations uh, towards efforts to promote pro core inclusive green growth initiatives among governments and international partners. And if you're interested, you can find more information about the GGKP Annual Conference on the GGKP website or at www.gggweek2016.org. And of course, we hope uh, you will all join us at the GGKP Annual Conference and Global uh, Green Growth Week overall. Now, before introducing our moderator for today's event, I would like to highlight just a few logistical issues. First, we strongly encourage participants to raise questions to our speakers throughout the webinar. You can do so by typing your questions into the chat box on the right side of the webinar dashboard. Your questions will be submitted to our technical staff, who will then repost them to all participants and for panelists to address during the Q&A session. We will also be circulating a survey after the webinar concludes, and I encourage you to complete it to provide us with the feedback we need to help shape our future webinars. And finally, if you have any technical issues with the webinar, please email us at contact at ggkp.org, and we will help you to troubleshoot the problem. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Oliver Greenfields. Oliver should be well known to many of you. He is convener for the Green Economy Coalition, which is currently housed at IIED. And convener is actually a carefully considered title to reflect uh, network leadership, inviting people from diverse institutions and networks to work together and enabling them to influence collectively. Before joining IIED, Oliver was head of sustainable business and economics 
at WWF UK, uh, and he's where he's currently funded from, so the Green Economy Coalition. At WWF, he pioneered, pioneered systematic uh, shareholder change programs, including One Planet Business, One Planet Finance, and One Planet Economy. And so, Oliver, it is now my great pleasure to turn the web webinar moderation over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Oreste, and also a very warm welcome to our large group of people from around the world that have joined this webinar. My name is Oliver Greenfield, calling and speaking to you from a um, rainy London, first thing in the morning, wherever you are in the world. I hope that this will be a really interesting interactive session. We encourage you to post your comments. I have a few comments from me just to give a bit of context to this conversation before we bring in our experts and panelists. Um, there is a, this is, I think, and many of the coalition members think, one of the profoundly most important questions, not just to our development models, but also more broadly to our economies. There is a conversation emerging, certainly amongst Western audiences, around one of the biggest threats to our political democracy is that we it has failed to deliver economic democracy. It is a conversation I see emerging even within mainstream players. For example, the Royal Society of Arts, a very a bastion of establishment in the UK, has got a work theme on economic democracy. We also see the World Economic Forum having conversations about the, the, global, the gro global risks and they talk about profound social instability as one of the world's greatest risks coming explicitly from rising income and wealth disparity. So we are talking about a question of how do we make sure that our economies are fairer. We see organizations like Oxfam capturing the zeitgeist with their comments on 88 people now own as much as the bottom half of the world's economy. We see CAFOD and the Pope tell us that the, we do not have two crises, we have one crisis. We don't have a crisis of just environment and social crisis, we have one crisis. We see in the coalition, we see increasing numbers of development organizations, Oxfam, CAFOD, Tier Fund, Plan, Christian Aid, coming to this agenda and saying, Climate change is real, profound, and it's starting to impact the issues of the poorest. And some of the successes we have achieved over the last few years are starting to be undermined by the impacts of climate change. So, in that context, we are, and thanks very much to the work of all those involved in the climate negotiations in Paris, we are seeing an acceleration of activity to address climate change. We have a profoundly ambitious challenge to address turning our economies into low carbon economies. The contention of the Green Economy Coalition and our members is this is a once in a generation opportunity to transform our economies for climate. We would be at fault if we did not grasp that opportunity and make sure that we make that economic transition work for everybody. Make sure that we use it to genuinely end poverty and to genuinely address the concerning trend of growing inequalities. So that is the agenda that we see. This is not just a, about a new development model, it is about a new economy that is emerging around the world. Very easy to say, very difficult to do. And it is therefore my privilege to bring together three participants, panelists, and organizations. We shall hear from Steve Bass, the first senior associate of the International Institute of Environment and Development, IIED. IIED at the forefront for over 40 years of championing the voice of the marginalized, the poorest in our societies, at the fringes who have a, earn their livings and their livelihoods at the fringes of societies and economies, the informal markets, the slum dwellers, the, the people that have been underrepresented by the dominant economic model. How do we make sure that this economic transformation meets their needs, gives them a stake, gives them a voice, and gives them an improved livelihood? 
Secondly, we shall hear from Inhi Chung, Senior Sustainability and Safeguard Specialist at GGGI. The Global Green Growth Institute has been absolutely at the forefront of driving and developing this new development model, green growth, green economy. And it is really exciting that they are deeply questioning how do they make sure that the economic model that they are proposing and helping others and governments to address really does make a difference and make sure that this is a pro-poor inclusive green growth. So it is great that they are opening their questioning and understanding and developing ideas of how to make sure that model is deployed in country meets the needs. And then we shall hear from George Veraghese, a different perspective, President of Development Alternatives, an organization in India that has been absolutely central to sustainable developments and the rights of those that have been excluded, developing business models, developing livelihoods, developing solutions on the ground for people in India. So really getting a sense of when this model works, we see a change in livelihoods for those people that George can talk directly on behalf of. So a fantastic panel, a profoundly important question. Let us grasp this opportunity of economic reform that climate change demands of us and ensure it works for everybody explicitly and including the poorest that have been so far excluded. Very difficult questions. I will first bring in Steve Bass, first senior associate of IIED, and his thoughts on that. Steve, over to you. Thanks very much, Oliver. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, this presentation and the report that it refers to uh, are about putting the human dimension into green growth. As Oliver said, the global conversation is moving this way. In the last couple of years, um, a number of green economy, green growth initiatives uh, are also moving in this direction. And I'd like to thank GGGI for its leadership in getting to grips with the tough question of how we can put people at the center of efforts for um, green growth um, and GGKP uh, for their efforts for beginning to share the, the findings we have. I'm just one of seven authors here. I'd like to share a little bit about what we have found. Um, I think what drives us and drives GGGI is the notion that um, uh, green economies will be owned by a majority, uh, that they will serve people who've been failed by the current economic system, um, uh, and it will not just be a question of uh, a few players benefiting. The challenge is that there are many institutional and governance structures to, to change, to put people at the center whether it's institutional silos and incoherence, <clears throat> fiscal policies, issues of rights and infrastructure. So this is, in many ways, a, a long-term uh, agenda. Um, uh, let me start. I guess the problems that we believe that inclusive green growth will address range from those of poverty and climate change uh, and environmental degradation and the inability in the bottom right here of, of policy makers to really get to grips with things in a climate of uh, constant change. We're at a kind of a chaos stage at the moment where the, the, the old world order isn't quite working, but the new order, more inclusive and greener approaches, are not yet mainstream. This is our challenge. I think it's interesting to start by saying where we have got to. This is an issue of as I say here, patchy progress. We have had income poverty halved. We do have policies converging, linking poverty and environment, and the sustainable development goals are um, present a mandate here for action. But the gains in poverty reduction are, are, are vulnerable. There are all sorts of problems, whether it's in markets with price collapses uh, or vulnerable rights so that poor people are easily squeezed out in land grabs and green grabs. And 
at the same time as we have made a little progress, I think we know that areas that concern both poverty and environment uh, have not been resolved. Absolute numbers of slum dwellers are all sorts of damage and deaths from climate change, significant ecosystem degradation. Still, a growth alone is not helping. The declining human development in some of the highest growth countries suggests that growth alone is not enough. And I think Oliver just alluded to the World Economic Forum survey. This was the 2015 survey. Six of eight global risks concern the links between people, particularly poor people, and the environment, issues of uh, migration and being squeezed out. And this development model isn't quite working. We still have least developed countries that have not so-called graduated from their status. There are, of course, isolated uh, successes, but exclusion and a governance that doesn't help the poor it seems to be very much behind this. Whether it's rent-seeking by uh, privileged groups and companies, taking uh, forests and fish resources, for example, uh, whether it's foreign investment seeking, uh, for example, farmland rather than you know, coming into countries of Africa and, and, and buying up farmland rather than investing in the farmer, whether it's the institutional fragmentation that means that environmental institutions are marginalized, local government is marginalized in decisions, or generally the early approaches to green growth, uh, which have not helped this. I think GGGI itself would admit that early efforts looked only at reduction of carbon rather than um, tackling issues of poverty and other green issues. Big technology firms, infrastructure, uh, this is fine, but it uh, didn't, didn't focus on the potential benefits of and, including the poor, it assumed a continued trickle-down approach, lots of social costs of moving to green, people stuck in brown economies, not well considered, and essentially uh, early green growth initiatives being, uh, if not quite a stitch-up, then a, an issue of deals between uh, uh, privileged groups with very little voice of the poor and of the um, informal economy actors where they are. So we believe, those of us who've examined where we've got to and where we need to go, that there are issues of structural reform to be addressed, if step by step, and getting societal ownership to complement so far the, the quite strong top-down push to green growth. Let's um, touch on the potentials, and there are, there are many. And the, the Green Economy Coalition has a marvelous um, collection of what we call glimpses of green economy in uh, isolated uh, conditions uh, all over developing countries. We've decided to, to sort of present the potential in terms of a business case for inclusion, since uh, so many people are very hard-nosed about the notion of inclusion. Of course, there are very strong ethical arguments to do with social and economic justice, and they link to these more instrumental arguments. But if you, if you talk about involving those who've been excluded, you actually find we're talking about a majority. In, in so many countries, the informal economy that is just not supported and, and very often considered to be illegal uh, is not the basis for green economy work so far. The landless, slum dwellers, unemployed, you add these up and this is the majority of a population. So we need to put such people at the center of our th thoughts and efforts. If we think inclusion, we are better able, I think, to think about job creation, uh, natural resource-based job creation, natural resources being the main non-labor asset in developing countries. Many people in, in urban areas are able to uh, generate new patterns of urban uh, living, issues of formalizing waste management, for example, uh, uh, at costs lower than municipalities can provide. And a whole set of jobs need to be created in non-tradable sectors, the kind of sectors that are not affected by international competition. 
and governments can well afford to invest in jobs in the sorts of infrastructure that would enable uh, jobs in natural resources, um, health and social services, the, the, the backbone of inclusive green economy. So many jobs need to be created, but they can't only be created that, that when they cost a million dollars per post. We need to find jobs that cost hundred dollars, ten dollars per post. Jobs that recognize the reality that, um, as some have described, the GDP of the poor, issues of uh, managing forests and fisheries and water, this provides the GDP of the poor. This is what we should be focusing on, the ecosystem services, if we want to create an inclusive green economy. If we are more inclusive, we think about we would be aiming at bigger market size. Some of that market size is necessary to, to stimulate major uptake of, of um, energy transport changes. And an inclusive approach, of course, by reducing social problems would reduce the kind of costs that governments have to bear in terms of those problems. So there's a fairly strong case, we think, as well as the a strong ethical case that I, I haven't highlighted here. Our report talks about a four-part agenda, essentially around uh, improving governance and putting poor people at the center, inclusion in the whole process of uh, consultation, dialogue, planning, implementation, and sharing the benefits of, of, of green growth. So inclusion in governance, and also much better uh, um, integration of institutions, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we have, we've, we've shifted in the whole discussion of sustainable development from a focus on environment to a little bit on social to Rio in 2012, touching on economic, but we believe the next challenge is to build the right institutions for sustainable development. Development. The second area of the agenda, in the four-part agenda, is empowerment issues, really putting the rights, the knowledge systems of poor people at the center and the assets that they have, strengthening them, building in them, investing in them as assets for a green economy, and shifting the, the informal sector towards uh, a kind of formalization that works for local people in their own circumstances and allows them to gain access to finance and support. And in that token, we start to lay out a finance agenda, talking about um, accessing uh, quality investment uh, for, for poor groups. A whole range of innovation in microfinance and microinsurance needs to be reviewed and built on. Um, the whole notion of, of managing natural resource revenues to be focused on poverty reduction and to maintain those resources as part of the agenda. And finally, um, changing the narrative, changing the metrics, continuing to make the case to the current institutional regimes that this form of approach is more uh, beneficial to uh, people, uh, more beneficial to the environment in the long run. And of course, we we uh, propose a sort of continuous improvement approach, based upon the the, the approaches to date that we've seen in various countries. Um, and what we emphasize in this um, sort of uh, cyclical approach is participation and development of institutions at the centre and communications. I would say driving this approach to exploring, democratically exploring the different options for uh, inclusive green growth in the country. Putting together a set of policy instruments that will work. We, we, have, we have in the report suggested a kind of core set of those instruments. Um, much more attention to involvement in, in implementation of forms of partnerships, etc. And of course learning from where we've got to. And some of the case studies in the back of the report from several countries touch on aspects of this process. I'd just like to, to um, give a little bit of a focus in three or four areas. One is this notion of dialogue to kick the whole process off. 
But with the Green Economy Coalition, IAD has held dialogues, multi-stakeholder dialogues, in eight countries. Um, and it's quite interesting how each one of those countries came up with a much more human agenda than we had thought, human well-being at the centre. This is all about creating the right jobs for the future. Um, equity, people taking part and benefiting, uh, using natural capital and adding value, not just an issue of, of um, uh, greenhouse gas abatement, working with all, within all ecological boundaries, or, or nine, let's say, rather than just climate change. And growth, of course, required to deliver that, all of these things, not in its own sense. Um, getting a much better sense that society, society's involvement will be a great complement to top-down leadership. Um, a second point is the focus on diagnosing what the assets that poor people have available to them. And of course, they will have some financial assets, some intellectual property and manufactured capital, but with a particular focus on the social um, and natural capital that work with one another. I mean, it's, it's interesting how the recent agricultural science assessment um, concluded that we really now need to bring together high tech and local people's knowledge of how to manage ecosystems. So diagnosing the assets available to people in different localities, in different sectors, strengthening the asset, enabling them to access them, getting finance and um, management conditions uh, for the use of that capital and the right kind of technology. I'm nearly finished now, but I think, as I mentioned before, as we focus on uh, an inclusive approach, we need at the same time to wire together the institutions that have been so separate and have only allowed um, inclusion uh, in isolated cases. So this is a bit of a cartoon, but we need to move from a situation where we have total siloed, separate, antagonistic institutions, which is now only in a few countries, towards more of a, a safeguard approach, environmental safeguards on development and poverty safeguards on what we do in the environment, in national parks, etc., which is a kind of do-no-harm approach. Moving more to synergies, how can we reduce poverty, create jobs, and manage environment. And the, the, the report covers many examples of this, but they are isolated. And the reason they're isolated is that the, the economic and governance conditions don't quite allow uh, this to be the norm, that, that environment, poverty uh, are managed at the same level. So we need to start to move to the fourth level here, where institutions designed around equitable, sustainable uh, development. That, that, I think, is the long-term challenge of those aiming at green growth. To start with uh, safeguards, of course, to find the synergies, catalogue them so that people can copy them, they understand the conditions under which particular uh, projects, initiatives in different sectors, work and a move towards uh, institutional scale. This, this last slide looks to be a little bit um, idealistic, but I think the longer term challenge is to shift from the left of this diagram, which in a sense uh, summarizes the fact that the biosphere is being uh, gobbled up irrespective of limits by people who are slaves to the current economic regime. We need to move from that. We need to turn it totally inside out so that we have a situation where the economy serves uh, the whole of society in an inclusive way within environmental limits. And this is the kind of dialogue, this is the kind of vision that I think um, a multi-stakeholder approach in country can, can uh, begin to understand and lead towards. Anyway, as I say, I'm only one of seven authors, there are many others. Um, uh, the report I 
commend to as a as a bit a, a bit of a kind of resource to its buyer. It's not yet guidance. Um, in here, we'll talk about how GGG has been bold enough to start to make guidance from uh, uh, f from what we've found. Uh, but uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Oliver. Over to you, is it? Thank, Thank you very much, much, Steve. So, really, some contours of the challenge, and now having set that challenge, we now come over to In He Chung from Senior Sustainability and Safeguards from Global Green Growth Institute. Global Green Growth Institute leading and supporting governments and national plans emerging on green growth. And this thinking really helping to inform their approach. So In He, it'd be really interesting to see what this has meant to your work going forward. It'd be great if you will explain that to us. Thank you very much. In He. Thank you, Oliver. Um, just before I start, um, I think we're Gigi Jones very fortunate to have IAD and GCF partners as we try to strengthen the social dimensions of, of green growth. I think Steve mentioned uh, during his presentation that uh, initially Gigi Jones focused very much on the low carbon element, but now we are you know, trying very hard to also cover other environmental aspects as well as the, the social, the social inclusion and cost reduction dimensions. Um, a little bit about GGGI. Um, we were established in, in 2010 and obtained international organization status in October 2012. So we are still quite a young organization. We currently have 26 member countries and we are in operation in 24 countries. Uh, I'm sorry, we are in operation in 24 countries, so we have 24 country programs um, and have a little over 35 country projects. We also have um, global knowledge products that we um, aim to share with our country teams and GGKP is, is one of the, the platforms for that. Um, and we are shaping our green investment uh, department where uh, we're trying to get the uh, financial flows for green growth strategies and plans to be implemented at the country level. So that's a little bit about GGGI. Um, just a little bit also about our strategic plan 2015-2020. Um, where we specifically uh, outline our mission of accelerating the transition to a resilient world of strong, inclusive and sustainable growth. And we're doing that through supporting our partner countries to move towards a model of green growth that simultaneously achieve the three interlinked elements. And you can see they are the economic growth, environmental sustainability, poverty reduction and social inclusion. And these three aspects are clearly um, laid out in our strategic plan. So now the operational guide. Uh, this is a practical how-to note to GGGI IID publication. Uh, we, it was developed together with IID following the completion of the joint report which uh, Steve um, presented. And we started testing this at the beginning of this year. Starting with the formulation of five-year country strategic plans, we have what we call a country planning framework where the countries with the government partners um, develop a five-year mid-term strategic plan to see how GGGI can support the, our partner countries to move towards this new model of green growth. And uh, we've used this, this guide to try and, try and help um, strengthen the social dimensions of that, of that plan. Also, the work program budget 2017-2018 process has, has started and it's just near completion as, as we speak. And in that, uh, there is a project concept note and a project full proposal template which we specifically reference the operational guide for protocol inclusive green growth. And we've been testing out you know, how this can be appropriately applied to, to our country programs. We also this is especially targeted the new least developed country, developed country to test and implement the operational guide as they are the more, you know, there are more opportunities to consider the infrastructure and social inclusion aspects from the initial stage. So these are some of the things that have been happening since the beginning of the year. Maybe it's um, beneficial to present our GGGI's um, delivery model. Uh, we have what we call a value chain, starting from diagnosis to growth impact assessment, moving on to sector and subsector strategy planning, 
which will then inform the design, financing, and implementation of the Green Growth Strategy. So this is sort of the value chain that we work um, we work against, and we have four thematic areas that we focus, namely energy, uh, green city development, water, and land use. So what we're trying to do in the operational guide is to help country teams to strengthen the assets of the poor and excluded in our interventions, um, support uh, small-scale manufacturers and farmers, and also target where poor people live and work in terms of sectors and, and, and location. Um, so it's, it's a very purposeful um, intervention where we try and incorporate these elements into, into, the, uh, into our activities and our, our project development uh, process. So in practice, what does this really mean? Well, in the five-year country strategic plan, which I mentioned a moment ago, or country planning framework, um, we normally go do a situation analysis and a green growth potential assessment, which would then help us to identify the gaps um, and help us to lay out a plan to, uh, to fill those gaps. And in the situation analysis, we specifically um, ask uh, then to purposefully address the property rush and social inclusion elements um, and see whether you know, there are some possible co-benefits or synergies between economic growth, environmental sustainability and property production and social inclusion aspects. Uh, in the, the CPF again, stakeholder analysis and engagement plan is, is a very important aspect. GGGI has mainly engaged with go our government partners to date but we are really trying to encourage our country teams to broaden our stakeholder base, so that includes private sector, especially the uh, micro and small and medium enterprise representatives, as well as um, the gender, gender stakeholders, um, and also um, other civil society organizations. We're also trying to um, link our country planning frameworks to the seven sustainable development goals, especially with the nine uh, SDGs as drivers of inclusive green growth, and it's, it's mentioned in our publication, and see how GGGI's uh, intervention can actually address implementing the SDGs at the country level. So those are some of the practical things that we're considering at the moment um, with this operational guide. Uh, general guiding questions, I mentioned the first one. We, wanna, we, we understand and appreciate the fact that there are trade-offs between Environmental sustainability, economic growth, and, and public structures, which are inclusion. However, if we can capture the co benefits or synergies between those three elements and, and, uh, and really try and program those elements into our projects, we feel that uh, those three elements could be perhaps adequately addressed. Also, we are asking our country teams to see how our interventions can increase access to basic social services, um, especially uh, energy, water, and housing being you know, three of our four core thematic areas. And see how our interventions also contribute to job creation or improve opportunities for the informal sector and micro, small, medium enterprises. So, so those are some of the things that we are doing in practice. Um, and just to give you a bit more concrete example, um, GGGI country programs so far have been mainly concentrating at the policy advice and support to our partner governments. But we aim to increasingly assist governments in implementing the national green growth strategies and policies, which will involve at least designing concrete on the ground implementation projects. So we're quite keen that those implementation projects have positive public reduction social inclusion impacts. Um, some Demonstration projects we have been looking at include the three that I have on the slide. Uh, the first one is the climate resilient green growth um, work in South Vicente in the Philippines. Now, we have initiated this work from last year, and um, basically, uh, the, the work that we are looking at from this year onwards is capacity building of the municipality for South Vicente so that um, climate adaptation planning and implementation. At the same time, efforts to do that at the same time increases production and creates jobs. Um, and we are looking at, uh, you know, for example, sustainable tourism strategies um, and protecting the natural marine and agriculture forest resources, which actually are the basis for the livelihoods of the, the villagers of the San Vicente. So that's one example. In Rwanda, um, they have developed the uh, 
national roadmap for green secondary city development. And it's in line with, with Rwanda's Vision 2020 and their um, economic development and poverty reduction strategy, the second one, the EPRS2. Um, so in that, uh, in relation to that, we have been uh, working or been starting to engage the Minister of Gender and Family Promotion to first provide assistance to practitioners to mainstream gender into the green city planning process, um, identify possible entry points for women's contribution to the development of green cities, and promote women's empowerment and gender equality in the development of green city um, planning. So those are some of the things that we are looking at and will continue to strengthen that in Rwanda. Um, another, an element of the safeguards issue in the green city development work is the, the responsible resettlement, given that there, there are some displacement implications in this work. And uh, so this is another aspect that we're looking together with uh, our government partners in Rwanda. The third example is the Amazon vision in Colombia. Uh, it's an initiative to reduce de deforestation in the Colombian Amazon region through a payment for performance scheme. Some of you might be aware of this. Um, Norway, Germany, and the United Kingdom have agreed to contribute 100 million US dollars to this initiative. And this, this initiative actually uh, includes the preparation of a portfolio of investments to tackle deforestation drivers, including um, interventions to strengthen agro environmental production through alliances with peasants indigenous people and larger landowners committing to sustainable management of natural resources. So during this process, we really want to get that bottom-up um, input from, uh, from the societal demand that, that Steve mentioned to, to see how we can make this a bit more of a pro for inclusive green growth initiative. We're also supporting uh, the, the red safeguard system as well as, as part of the country program. Going looking forward, we are looking at Senegal and Uganda, which are our uh, new country programs in the, in the least developed, developed country. And um, the discussion is still in the process, but we're potentially looking at uh, collaboration with IID and, and GEC to, to work more on the societal demand aspects of green growth in Uganda and Senegal going forward. So that actually concludes my part of the presentation, and uh, I'll have to hand over the microphone to uh, Oliver. Thank you very much indeed, Inhi. I think that uh, the growth and success and global coverage of the Global Green Growth Institute in such a short period of time really gives a flavor of how important this agenda is and how quickly it is being adopted around the world but also, therefore, how important we get it right and make sure that it addresses both climate change and the needs of the poorest. And there is an organization that for many years has been ensuring that those social and environmental issues on the ground have been considered, solutions developed, largely maybe in absence of a empowering economic context, and that is development alternatives. So. It is with great pleasure that I turn the table over to George and we can hear his response to what he has heard from our two previous presenters, where it's going and how it feels about its success and its challenges specifically with India and more broadly. George, the webinar is yours. Thank you, Oliver. Well, uh, good afternoon from a hot sunny afternoon in New Delhi. It's 42 degrees centigrade outside, and if I recall, the temperatures have crossed the 40 degree mark more than only about five days in a year, only in the recent past. Previously, uh, till about five years back, crossing the 40 degree mark was a rarity. Now it's very, very common. Climate change is here to stay. In this kind of a context, is it possible to make pro-poor inclusive growth a reality? Uh, at the outset, let me thank GGGI for this opportunity. We are a member of GGKP, also our colleagues at IIED, and also uh, the GEC for this opportunity to share some of our experience and insights in in this problem area. 
Steve outlined the poverty environment problematic that is confronting the world today. At the same time, he also gave us some of the potentials and finally suggested a possible four-pronged agenda. On this basis, in he highlighted some of the guiding principles on how to make pro poor inclusive growth a possibility. I'll come from the vantage point of where we have been working on the ground. I'm going to try and illustrate what both of them have said with a couple of practical examples. The first one I would like to take up is in terms of let's look at the farmer in the, in the, and in the context of India at least uh, a little over 50 percent of the people are still in rural India and most of them are dependent on farming. Given that, what are the kind of possibilities that are there in terms of inclusive growth for them? Number one, can we look at the possibility of having food security, water security, energy security at the same time? And when all these three things come together, is there possibility in terms of these communities having resilience to climate change? I'll give you a couple of practical things which we have been doing with thousands of farmers in central India. Incidentally, the temperature there at this point of time must be easily 46 to 48 degrees centigrade. Introduction of very, very simple technologies, green growth technologies, drip and sprinkler irrigation has been around, but most of the farmers still carry on using flood irrigation. With drip, drip and sprinkler irrigation, you can reduce the water requirements to one third of what it is today. By reducing the water requirements in a single crop, the farmer knows exactly what it is like to have an additional crop. An additional crop means doubling their income and much more other livelihood and societal opportunities for the farmer and their family. With this, once the water security is possible, the second crop also ensures food security and with a little bit of surplus, health, education, no more becomes a luxury. They're able to send their children to school. And with better food, in fact, they spend less on uh, health services. Now, because you are using simple drip and sprinkler irrigation, and you have reduced the requirement of the water to one third, what essentially happens is you're able to do renewable energy based. For example, solar energy irrigation systems are then become a possibility. We have now experimented this on our own farms and on farms of more than 250 farmers in the central part of India. We are working with other agencies to have this multiplied many more fold in other parts of the country. The reason why I say this is with the water security, the food security, and the energy security, what's most interesting is you might have heard that there are several parts of India that are now suffering from drought. These farmers whom we have worked with fortunately have enough water and food and they do not have to migrate. Now, this is the kind of potential which both Steve and Inhi was talking about. If you look at the principles which Inhi mentioned earlier, you will see that they cover all the principles that she has mentioned. Now, how do the challenge is how do we scale up? Let me give you one more practical example in the little bit of time which I have. The second one is in terms of energy. Let's take a typical village 
in a far off place in the Indian context again, typical number of households will be approximately 100 to 150. Uh, the official statistics and documentation will show that it is a electrified village. Now I'll tell you what it means in official statistics. There is a stand post where electricity is supposed to come. The village head person's house plus a couple of his uh, cronies are supposed to have electric connections. Yes, they get this electric connections for three to four hours in a day. But the rest of the village, according to statistics, will have electricity, but will have to depend on kerosene and other kinds of uh, fuel for both lighting and other kinds of energy needs. Given that, some of the experiments we have tried, we have used renewable energy based, both biomass and solar, and the solar example is easier for me to convey the message. If approximately 30 to 35 households take a connection, another 20 to 30 of the shops and establishments in a village, if I may use those words, now it's interesting. You must understand who these shops and establishments are. They are number one, uh, the carpenter, the barber, the mobile repair shop, the guy who does Xeroxing and gives you a printout, a photo studio, so these are the so-called shops, establishments, and micro-enterprises that are possible in a village. Now, if another 20 to 30 of these guys also take connections, so total approximately 80-odd connections in the village, based on a renewable energy station in the village, we are able to run a viable enterprise to provide energy to the 30-odd households and the 20 to 30-odd enterprises. It makes a world of a difference to these people because they become part of the mainstream. They are able to learn a livelihood. Their children are able to uh, study in the night. And the world turns around. The reason why I'm giving you these two examples is based on the study which Steve mentioned, and uh, the principles which were outlined by Inhi, what are the three simple steps bottom up? We saw the uh, principles and the steps that are possible top down. What are the three, uh, three simple steps that are possible bottom up? Number one, build up large scale awareness among the poor communities about their rights and opportunities. You would have noticed that uh, Steve highlighted this in at least two or three of his slides. Number two, building capacity. We have to invest in building capacity so that the absorptive capacity of poor communities is enhanced. Otherwise, any kind of initiatives that are going to go top down will only benefit the rich. In this context, I need to say there is nothing called instant coffee in this business. It takes time to build capacity. We have to look at the time that it takes for them to build their absorptive capacity. Our experience has also shown that it is more life skills that you, one has to focus on. The technical skills is comparatively easy uh, to convey. And finally, and probably the most important, is the third step in terms of aggregating and or institutionalizing them to build their bargaining capacity to have access. And in here I again refer to one of your principles so that they have the power of the numbers with the bargaining capacity to access technology, finance, markets, and most important of all, the management capacity. I will stop here and hand over to Oliver so that when the questions come up, we can give you more practical examples. Thank you. George, thank you very much. Some very vivid examples. And I, I think that we've heard firstly from Steve on ways to bridge 
the gap between a economic planning process and the needs of the poorest and excluded. Very interesting question about how do we scale up some of the solutions that George has mentioned. Is the national planning processes that are supported by GGI one way that we start to scale up these solutions? There, George also mentioned this challenge of time, how long it takes to build capacity, life skills, management, bargaining capacity. But at the same time, we know from George's intro, there is also a climate clock ticking, getting hotter. The tension between action drives many to work with big players, get things moving quickly. But the challenge of ensuring that we build capacity of the poorest and invest for the long term is also profoundly important. How do we close those two and ensure that we develop an economic model that addresses both the climate clock that builds the capacity and challenges addressed by some and experienced by the, some of the poorest in our societies. Okay, well, there have been a number of questions that have come through. I hope we can get to the majority of them. Let's stay with Asia. And there is a question from Drazen Kukun. Apologies if I've not pronounced your name correctly, Drazen. Asian cities, one of the fastest areas of urbanization, explosion of growth of cities. How do we ensure green growth in its policies for Asian cities is explicit on the poor and vulnerable that are drawn to those cities? In the GGI is explicit about sectors, and one of those is cities. What, perhaps we should come to you first for your answer to Jerome. Sorry, uh, Oliver, I was looking <laughs> around with a question window. Could you repeat the question? How can green growth policies explicitly in relation to Asian cities ensure better livelihoods and opportunities for those poor and vulnerable people that are drawn to those cities and that those cities as they grow can be places of real green growth, inclusive green growth livelihoods. Okay, thank you Oliver. Um, yes, TGGI has uh, quite a few programs in the Asia Pacific region, and more and more um, LDC countries are uh, being part of, of the, our Asia Pacific portfolio. Uh, it's a very, very, very good question and a very important one for us because um, a lot of the Asian countries are fast growing economies, and uh, we have uh, green city development projects uh, in Vietnam, Cambodia that are also looking at. You know, how do we then incorporate slum dwellers and other marginalized groups within the city to benefit from the, uh, the green city development projects that GGGI is promoting? So it is, it is a question that we, we, ha we are considering very seriously. Um, I guess because we work very closely with the governments at this point uh, in developing their um, green city uh, national strategy, um, these considerations need to be very much factored in. And also, we need to identify the stakeholders who can really inform um, us on some of the, the important features that we need to consider. So I think that's how we are trying to, to address this issue for TGI. Thank you. George, I'm not sure whether development alternatives have much work in the planning of large cities, but if you do, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, we have comparatively be much more rural than urban, 
but in the little bit of work that we have done and in the context of what has been announced by the Prime Minister about a year back in terms of 100 odd smart cities, uh, we have tried to bring in something called the human angle to this and tried to use what we call the young citizens from among the youth and the school children. We have what is called a 4 A's program in the cities. Basically, the first A's is to build large scale awareness based on systematic assessment that is done in terms of air quality, water quality, and this is through tools and techniques that are provided to citizens groups. Based on that, we do action and advocacy with the other government agencies so that it can be taken up on a much more larger scale. Thank you, George. Steve, I know that IID have experience of slum dwellers supporting their thinking and rights. How would you answer that question? I think uh, it's a good question. Uh, cities, if you think about it, cities uh, bring together s uh, so many systems that we've got to work through to uh, develop inclusive green growth. The energy system basically describes the economy. The transport system water and sanitation system, the, the food system, the incredible challenges of getting food into a city every day, and the ICT system. So they bring the challenges for green growth into focus. They also present tremendous opportunities through economics of proximity to do all this together in a spatially planned way. I mean, I think there's two things I would say. One is we need to look for the institutional richness in cities. It is not just a question of city government. There are all sorts of citizens groups concerned about those systems, transport systems, food systems. We need to bring them together to design one inclusive green system. Um, cities bring into focus the fact that, that poverty and environment is an intensely local thing. So we need to build on those institutions. And what I would say in terms of inclusion is particularly those who represent slum dwellers, poor and marginalized. And in this respect, there are some new institutional players that I think could help the Green Growth Initiatives, particularly um, Slum and Shack Dwellers International, federated at city, national, and international level. Groups who could take charge of their resources do things in terms of uh, sanitation, construction, cheaper than municipalities, access, those sorts of funds. So new players, we need to find them. Um, I think that's all I'll say, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, my, I now work in the Green Economy Coalition. There is an interesting uh, awareness that cities are a microcosm where you have a policy leadership by city mayors and mm. authorities where they get they get green jobs, they get social progress, they understand green spaces, they understand environmental assets, understand clean water, and they bring all of that together and they have the potential to ensure that cities are delivering against social, environmental, and economic challenges at the same time. Those tensions are explicit within a small geographical area. And so we see that those cities should be designed smart, green smart, social smart, economically smart. Thank you for that question, Drazen. I'm going to go now to a question that's come in from Shakira Houdani. And I think I'll direct this to Steve, um, because you, you were a leader of the analysis for this report. In your study, which countries are the most impressive, showing the most leadership? That's a, that's a nice question, isn't it? Not easy to answer, though. But I do think uh, we need to move towards a, a position where we could potentially rank countries against eight, ten must-do things. Uh, and in order to generate that, I think we need a, 
uh, are bringing together of those interested in inclusive green growth and a bit of a consultation. What is it that really counts? Well, I don't think any country has, has done this perfectly. Uh, they've tried it from different angles. So there are aspects of different countries that I, that I really like. No one's been through the whole process of a green growth strategy. Um, what I like in, let's say, South Africa is the honesty that they don't quite know yet what exactly inclusive green growth will look like, but they know they need to move there. They know they need to experiment. They need to bring different stakeholders together. So the notion of a green economy accord, I'm not sure quite how active it is now, but that accord where business, local authorities and government, civil society come together to, to work out sort of next steps, what should be tried, what could they uh, learn from, where next. So that notion of an agreement will try to go somewhere is a good one. I think South Africa as well has also been quite interesting in, in combining its experience of social and environmental protection and the job creation in restoring and protecting landscapes. So that's some aspects. I, what I really like in Wales, and it's covered in the in the report, is this notion that we have to move from the tragedy of short-term horizons, the, the, the quarterly capitalism, towards a much longer-term approach. And we need some way uh, in which to uh, look for future generations. So it's new Future Generations Act, uh, whereby the well-being of future generations needs to need to be factored into policies today. Uh, one last quick example. I think there are a number of countries, such as Zambia, who realize that if we are to mainstream these new approaches, the best starting block is to use existing approaches. So Zambia is intending that its seventh national development plan have the theme of inclusive green growth, so using existing processes to take us closer to green growth. And there are other countries in that respect. Thank you, Steve. So I get from your answer that there are bits of excellence mm -hmm. in different places. Maybe nobody is yet a star pupil. Um, in the, bring that question to you. Where has GGI seen those areas of excellence emerge around countries? Some examples that you have. Um, I've mentioned a few in my recent slide, but Rwanda has seen a drop in gender mainstreaming efforts, and we realise that um, we are uh, we've sort of benchmarking Rwanda in the region to, to see how gender can be considered in the national food growth strategy plan. So we're looking at Rwanda for gender mainstreaming issues. Um, Women's empowerment, again, I think Philippines can be a good example. Um, Mongolia has been, has been quite, uh, quite an example to other countries as well. So not many examples today, and that's why we're trying to um, get more in depth into the demonstration projects uh, going forward. Uh, but yeah, Philippines, Rwanda, I think those are the two countries that we see some very good. Thank you very much. I'm going to move now to an excellent question from Jeffrey Littman. We know that green growth planning, green economy planning, is something that governments, many governments around the world are now grappling with. But at the same time, we've just had a climate deal. And we've also signed up to the sustainable development goal. So Jeffrey's question is really around how do green growth assessments incorporate climate targets and commitments and the sustainable development goal? If you don't already, how should they? I'm looking at my panel, so can I put that one too? Steve, maybe I'll again start with you. Please wave to me, George, if you want to do it as well. Steve, let's start with you. Yeah. Thanks, Oliver. It, it is a good question. And of course, uh, some of the earliest green growth uh, work looked only at climate. I mean, it, it essentially said, uh, this was after the 2008 finance collapse, we're not growing anymore. How do we get growth and jobs again? Let's look at that piece of the economy that we might call the 
green sector, can we make money from greenhouse gas abatement? And some of the early work was simply looking at the productivity potentials from different forms of carbon abatement. Uh, and in fact, that was too narrow because, of course, any old carbon will do and it can create um, biodiversity and social problems. Now, of course, we're in a position where um, we have a fantastic um, new policy mandate. I mean, 2015 was such a game changer with the Paris Agreements and the SDGs and, and suddenly uh, ch China from being a bit of a green pariah was the biggest solar and wind producer. And so we now have a position where um, we need to, f we need to uh, use these, uh, meet these policy mandates, the SDGs and climate change in, um, agreements uh, through the green growth. The report has an interesting table with the various SDGs suggesting how green growth, inclusive green growth can um, achieve them. Um, and th this is up to each, each country to be able to match them together. Uh, I'll just finish by saying I think that what we face at the moment is um, apparently competing paradigms low carbon development, green growth, green economy, sustainable development. Uh, if it helps, I see that there's a bit of a, a, bit of a kind of um, uh, a spectrum. You start by thinking low carbon because every business now knows that um, high carbon is inefficient. As you move on to thinking a green growth, how do we grow the green economy? You then move on to thinking what actually should the whole economic set of rules be, green economy, in order to achieve sustainable development. So I think that there is a potentially a mental progression that way, others uh, less so. What I, am, what I am convinced of now is that the, the kind of potential barriers between these different approaches are now disappearing and people are combining their efforts uh, towards sustainable development. Okay. Uh, Oliver, let me pick up from where Steve left. Sure, George. Yeah. Um, uh, we've been doing this exercise for nearly 30 years now. Uh, India being, you can say, a continent in itself, the action lies at what is called the state or the provincial level, and even more so planning at the district level uh, in each one of the states and uh, we are what is called a national resource cell for district planning as recognized by the erstwhile planning commission which is currently called the Niti Aayog. Given that, how do you do this practically with line department peoples who have to get their day going every day? Um, when the climate issue came in, in fact, we did it with approximately seven states. Uh, from vulnerability assessments to adaptation planning to climate resilience, the works we had done with them, and then what we said, listen, this is not different from your normal district planning exercise. The emphasis on climate, because it has become important, is being laid out, but let's integrate it into this. Similarly, we believe and we have actually started talking to some of the state governments because they have called us now to say, hey, what's this new thing called the SDGs? We knew something called MDGs, now there's this new thing called SDGs. Now how do we incorporate that into our normal planning process? So we are talking with a couple of state governments in terms of how to in, uh, include and integrate the SDG thinking and concepts into the routine district planning. If it does not get integrated, you can pity the poor water systems engineer or some other kind of a planner on the ground, the agricultural person. They won't understand what it is. So the name of the game is, is to integrate into their routine planning processes. Thank you, George. Amy, do you want to come in on this one? I just want to um, reinforce what George said and what GGGI has been doing also is try and integrate the NDC commitment, the NDC and SDG elements into the national 
uh, development planning process. So it's not a, a separate track to what they're already doing, but you know, try and see how the interlinkages can be played out within the national development plan and strategy. So I think, yeah, I think that's, that's the important part. Thank you, Amy. If I may offer a slightly more radical from a, the GEC perspective, one may say that our environmental and social problems are in large contributed by to government's fixation only on economic growth, defined by GDP. But actually, we need to move to an understanding that we need to achieve societal and environmental goals alongside our economic goals. In that context, many parts of the world, really the coalition does not use the phrase from the economy, it uses the phrase sustainable development economy. And if you come to that conclusion, the next question is, what defines success for the sustainable development economy? If it's social, environmental, and economic improvements, the sustainable development goals. Okay, so let's now move to a question which is really about institution and transformation is this idea that we have really got to Why am I now? Oh, uh, structural reforms. We have a question from Karen Erasmus asking how do green growth plans overcome silo mentality in governments? And this is really this question that if we have a variety of goals all being delivered through our economic plan, those goals are not just owned by environment departments or the planning departments or treasury departments, but owned by them all in order to deliver institutional and economic transformation. How do you overcome government silo mentality? I'm looking at my panel. Who wants to go first? Steve is. Thank you, Steve. That's a really good question because, um, as we've suggested in this, this paper, the, the, it's now an institutional challenge. Um, the, the challenge are, challenges are to do with slightly different narratives, which mean people are talking across one another, where they could work together. They are in institutions clinging to ancient mandates and, and implementing sort of historical anomalies rather than getting to grips with uh, new challenges. And they're in the education system that, that, uh, that reinforces this. Um, I think there are a number of ways forward. One is that I think we've moved from the position where it's environment, people trying to push uh, notions of being greener, more towards um, people like finance and development who are starting to ask intelligent questions about it. So there's a kind of demand pull on this. And the more we can encourage that, the better. The more we can recognize the, the, the central role of uh, planning and finance ministries, but to challenge that role by asking them to seek new forms of information and new consultations, the better. So you know, I, I, I'm thinking of um, most green growth initiatives are, are aiming to deal with those central authorities. Uh, another thing, of course, is, is a joint exploration of realities. So with the coalition and IAD, we've produced that a little guide on green economy diagnostics and dialogues that set up a kind of interdisciplinary approach to exploring those realities. So people learn from one another the many lenses on inclusive green growth. It's not just a question, as it used to be, of economists in a planning ministry. There are others to talk to. Um, I think, as well, what we find useful is, is Yes, to go to local levels, uh, because then uh, issues become real, trade-offs and integration becomes about real things. So exploring more at local levels. 
Um, and in that respect, one of the bottlenecks is the, the lack so far, of, uh, frankly, of examples of things to copy and scale up. And there's nothing better, I think, than producing a huge catalog of the kinds of things that are working in local contexts that, that people can be inspired by. Um, the, the final thing I'll, I'll note is that projects, there are often projects that are interdisciplinary and plan well and begin to implement well, but uh, when the project ends, the people's job doesn't change. So we really need to look, uh, so they don't, they don't any longer practice integrated approaches. So we need to look at job descriptions, as simple as that, but we need to look at interdisciplinary training. Um, structuring uh, government administration, colleges and, and, and universities much more around um, interdisciplinarity and we need to embrace the science community and give it a real life, particularly in developing countries, in tackling the interdisciplinary challenges of inclusive green growth. Thank you Steve. In the GGI, it doesn't just arrive in a country, they embed there are people within government to support effective planning and thinking on these issues. What's your experience of overcoming silos and creating an in effect of a one government approach to these challenges? Thank you, Oliver. Um, one of the first things that we strive to do, and it's not always the case with all country programs, but we try and set up an interministerial committee or a body where we would invite. Um, key ministries to be part of this planning process. For example, in Indonesia, our uh, main counterpart is Bakanas, the, the planning ministry. But uh, with Bakanas sort of leading, we also um, involve other ministries into, into, this, uh, into, the thing, into our uh, program. And that's why it's called Government of Indonesia and GGGI programs, sort of GGGI country programs. So this interministerial setup, institutional setup, is, is very important. Uh, to start with. In the case of Rwanda, I see um, sort of a mainstream going on. I mentioned that the gender mainstream is being quite successful. And part of the reason I found out is that um, the, the gender uh, key performance indicator is, is an integral part of other ministries. So they have their own key KPI on, on gender mainstreaming. So that, that was very effective in, in getting the gender uh, agenda into all other ministries in the case of Rwanda. So those are the two examples that we've come across. Thank you, Whitney. George, we're, we're getting towards the end of this session now, so I'm going to direct that question, you can answer that question on overcoming silos, Steve mentioned lo local levels, but also I'm going to give you a final question from Dave Eon, which is really about how do you resolve the data inavailability challenge when you work with the voice of the poor and informal. And I guess that's really, you know, I, policy makers we, hearing the voice, being clear on the, on the facts, being clear on the information, a lot of it is, is, is deliberate. Um, so you can say we're not interested, but just the availability of the information it's very hard to collect. So how do you make sure people understand the issues of the poorest best and the information is supported with that? And similarly, how do you make sure that we overcome the silos so that we create a strong government approach? Uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm going to put the answer of both the questions together. The answer is in one word multi-stakeholder participation platforms. Whether it's the poor, the poor is also one of the uh, stakeholders. So unless, whether it's the silos within government or the other kinds of participants who have to come in to be part of a planning process, it is creating these platforms that is the most important. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples of how uh, we have achieved this. When we were building the capacity of state governments to do this, number one, you have to ensure that one of the ministries that doesn't have 
a vested interest is brought in as a joiner. So in the case of a state government, you either bring in the chief minister's office, the finance ministry, you see who holds the purse strings, can pull all the other strings that are required. And uh, otherwise, if there is a planning agency, again, their job is to integrate. We have learned the hard way to avoid the environment ministry because they tend to become one of the vested interest groups. So get the nudge from either the prime minister's office, the chief minister's office, whatever you call it, or the finance ministry so that the whole is brought together. From within government, bring in the different silos and have platforms and processes whereby the other stakeholders also can participate. Uh, I'll give you an example that we had last week. The Ministry of Personnel and Training called us and said, listen, there are all kinds of central services in the government of India. Can you train these people on complex sustainability issues? We said, yes, that's exactly what we want to do in the context of the SDG. I, I see Steve wave, uh, waving his hand. <laughs> Oliver, back to you. I, mean, I think he was just I'm saying sorry. he was happy not to come yeah. in there. You, you had uh, illustrated the point yeah. very well, yeah. uh, rather than dissent. Um, OK, so we are and drawing. One more point on the data, Oliver. Very quickly, George. Yeah, one more point on the data. Data has often been used as an excuse not to take a decision. Typically, a politician loves it when there is no data because then he or she can take the decision based on what they want to do. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example that happened to us about four years ago. Colleagues in GGGI, you might be using India was the first country to have something called the Interactive State of the Environment Atlas. It's there, a map can speak a million words. To get this passed in the government of India, it took me three years because they said data is not available. I said, let me use the fifth best, the sixth best, or the seventh best that is available, uh, that is available currently, but let it, let's make it available to all, and then we can go on improving. Okay, so my, you. yeah. Thank you, George. We are scheduled to finish in three minutes. So it is my job to thank our panel and to ensure that we are drawing to some conclusions. Um, first and foremost, we see that we are in a transition. Steve described this as the chaos moment when the old economy is not serving very well, cracks are spreading within it, the new economy is not there supporting at scale the livelihoods of the majority. We're in that transition period. This is an evolving and rapidly changing perspective. We see across the world pockets of leadership and excellence emerging, but nobody yet embracing the full concept, and nobody yet being able to say that they are supporting their societies from a green, inclusive economy. So, there are many questions that have been posed that we did not get the chance to come to, but this conversation is very much alive. It is very much for us to take it, to shape it, and to ensure that it spreads and includes more and more people. The lesson of inclusive green economy or green growth is that it must reach more people, both in the discussions, the concepts, the ownership, and ultimately the benefits and the improvement to livelihoods. So we have started this conversation. We are very grateful to GGGI for opening this space. We're very grateful for them to push forward at Jeju in September. The Green Growth Knowledge Platform, conversation about inclusive green growth, how to make it inclusive, how to make sure it is pro-poor. We're very grateful for the work of IAED, both helping found the 
coalition, but also representing the voices of the marginalized in these conversations and keeping us true to the authentic challenges that those people face. George, you brought a vivid picture of the challenges the people that your organization represents, inspirational solutions that are emerging, and the chance that this new economic planning models will take those to scale and improve the livelihoods of many millions and hopefully billions more. So it has been a fascinating conversation. I encourage everybody to who have not had their questions answered or others to engage with the email address up there, contact at GGKP, so we can keep this conversation alive, respond to those that, that document that has been written, download it, and be very clear that we are keeping this conversation open and we are keeping the actions and the evolution of the ideas open. So thank you very much for today. I think I've run over, which is probably my fault, but it's been a pleasure with all our panelists and with all of our participants. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I think we're...